It's my pleasure to introduce to you another speaker today. We've been hearing his name several times throughout the conference so far. Many of you have had a chance to sit down, talk with him a little bit. Now here's your opportunity to actually hear from the man himself and to listen to what he has to present to us today. He's going to be speaking on transitioning from closed systems, closed systems of energy, closed systems of technology, into open systems of energy and technology that can, that can be part of this movement moving into the world today. He has 15 years of passionate experience in this field, or as he, after he had a, an awakening to some of the problems and challenges that are facing humanity at this time. He also has a website fitting in with the educational piece that we've been discussing here today. So without further ado, I'd like to give you Mike Waters. Um, I'd like to uh, thank first um, Global BM for putting this on. And yes, it's true, you can't see anybody up here. <laughs> um, okay. That is not... We're not at the beginning, there we go. All right. Um, you know, before coming here and uh, before a lecture I gave last week, um, I looked at a lot of lectures to get some advice on how you should do these things because there is some very important information to share. Um, and I think some of the other speakers um, have had some really compelling uh, things to say. Um, one of the key issues that we're dealing with, um, for me, goes back 15 years in, in, in understanding what, what we're dealing with. Um, and I do feel that there is something very, very important to share because one of the biggest blocks we have to face is the beliefs of academia. Um, when you try to get funding, a physicist or an engineer is consulted and um, if you're dealing in the kinds of breakthroughs we are, there's a lot of resistance to even believing it's possible. And there's a reason as to why. So, 15 years ago, I, I did kind of wake up to what was going on. And before that, I had various backgrounds. And you can go onto my website. I, I won't spend time there as to what I did before that. But I did see that a lot of things were going wrong and uh, wanted to find out why. And as an inventor, I, I have a sort of a need for simplicity. So I like to look at complex systems and figure out what the root issue is. So I've become, I'd say, a futurist and a, a strategist. And uh, the difference between those two becomes clear when we are confronted what, with what we are, are facing. Um, you know, if, uh, if we were aliens in this room uh, looking at what's going on on this planet, it would be a very strange sight to see. I mean, we're running out of water on a planet covered with it, and the water that does cover it contains everything that we need. It has every single mineral compound element we need uh, for our health. And yet, we're running out of water on this planet that we use. Um, but it gets worse. We're the only land animal that actively seeks out water to defecate in, take a shit in. That is really strange. Um, we kill soil to grow food. Um, and in our education system, we are actually taught the opposite of reality and believe it. And I'm going to get into that. Um, I'm going to go over some technologies uh, on both sides of this fence, um, looking at some of the transitions that look like they're going to occur. Um, I'd love to delve into a lot of other subjects from consciousness to alchemy. But um, when I was thinking about what I could best say up here, um, for my part, 
uh, as a jigsaw piece among other jigsaw pieces. Um, how can I best help with what I know? And it really comes down to doing my best to explain what I see as being a, a crucial issue in what's caused this mess. And I believe this is kind of a Rosetta Stone. A Rosetta Stone is a discovery that unlocked a language. Um, and as a concept, it's sort of like getting the code of the program. Um, and once you lock into that information, once you tap that source, things become um, clearer. And it enables you to, to get a, a much simpler perspective on very complex situations like some of the ones we're facing now. So this is probably the most depressing slide of this talk, so I won't spend too long on it. But if we don't have some awareness of at least one or two of these things, we've got to be brain dead. Um, and it is very complex because we live in a synergistic system and everything is interrelated. And um, we could talk for days about that, uh, hopefully collaboratively. Um, but there is a root cause to all of this, and that's good news. Um, what I've found is that we've got two fundamental errors in our belief systems, and they're pretty basic, and they need to be. Um, and I touched on this at my uh, lecture two years ago at BM. Um, that has uh, even greater implications on the, one of those issues, uh, which is energy. And this is really why this conference is uh, being held, is because it turns out that the issue and our understanding of energy is also fundamental to how we relate to nature. And since these are the two main problems we're dealing with, energy keeps coming up and the understanding of it and the way it's infected our science as being one of our key issues that we're facing today and our way out. I love this, this uh, saying of Einstein, or maybe it was his wife. She was supposed to be quite brilliant. Um, the problems that exist in the world today cannot be solved by the level of thinking that created them. That is absolutely true. Uh, we are not going to solve those crises with the same systems thinking that got us into them. Uh, I'm going to go into nature briefly um, because most of this is going to be about energy and some of the, the toys we're playing with. But um, one of our main issues is that we've considered nature to be competitive dominant and m much of our um, cultural, uh, religious, um, economic, um, philosophies and systems have been based on competition dominant. It explains why we have problems with egos, uh, working together, accomplishing things in a proactive way. Uh, and the problem is, is that nature is not competitive dominant and there's abundant proof any way you look to prove this. And I'm going to show a, a, a short video because it, it's very compelling it's about the walls of Yellowstone and how a predator um, can in, uh, affect an entire ecosystem. Um, so nature is collaborative and collaboration leads to diversity. Um, it's just math. Uh, you've got to have a collabor collaboration dominant system in order for it to maintain itself. Um, otherwise, you do get that single winner end scenario. Uh, and this is quite well known. And I'm not going to spend too much time on nature because there's actually a lot of thinking now that is uh, taking us in a more sustainable direction. And I don't mean technocracy. And I was, that was a shocking, I, I didn't know about some of the, the agendas that were going on in that arena. But I do know that. Um, Things like global warming are used for political agenda on both sides of the fence. So 
I'm going to show this video, and I'll let it speak for itself. One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, that the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. So, um, there are some more uh, videos on my, my website that um, go into more of this, but uh, there's another side of this too. And this is not about global warming. This is about synergy and collaboration. And this is really um, a very, very important issue for this field. And um, going against uh, some considerable odds, uh, opposition to what we're trying to do, and yet um, knowing that it is about coming together and working uh, as teams. 
Um, similar effect with whales. Um, and also herding an, uh, animals. Uh, Alan Gregory gives an excellent talk on TED. Um, so we do affect the ecosystem. We do create pollution. There's no question. Um, the, the current model of our economics is depletion and lack-based, so we are depleting our resources. Um, but there is a more complex issue going on as well. But even though many forces affect change on this planet, um, we do have a responsibility to at least be sustainable in the right way. And I'm in favor of a decentralized approach to that. Um, there are some really scary charts out there about what's going on. We're facing all this desertification, and of course that's linked to global warming. But in reality, um, these things are just reminders that we're probably dealing with the wrong technologies right now. And this we'll get into very soon now. Um, you see a chart like this, and it's actually misleading because all that red up there um, is actually at the pole. Uh, and that's a much smaller area because this is a sphere. It wraps around. But it does show something interesting, that the upper latitudes appear to be warming more than the lower. And uh, like many here, the CO2 issue, we've had far more CO2 in the atmosphere in the past than we do now. So there's something else going on as well. Um, methane release concerns me more because, uh, as I understand, we've had two extinction events uh, due to methane in, in the history of this planet, at least. Um, John Peterson, uh, Arlington Institute, gave uh, a very good talk on this. He started um, being a very strong component, uh, proponent of um, the human-caused uh, climate change. And now has a, uh, an adjusted perspective on it. It's well worth uh, uh, watching, so if you go to his website. Um, he invited me to give a lecture a week ago. Um, it was a two-hour slot. I was the only speaker. And um, the reason I mention it is because I asked in the audience, I could see them, <laughs> um, what percentage were in the sciences and... Uh, who were engineers. Now, John Peterson is one of the top future, fu futurists. He's been an um, advisor to a number of presidents, uh, top military. Uh, he uh, uh, is involved in some pretty high-level stuff. And he's also uh, setting up a, a community uh, that I think is well worth looking at with a very good um, strategy for getting some of these technologies out. Fascinating guy. But he brings in some fairly high-level people from Washington to these talks. And of course, I was pretty nervous, just like today. And two hours is a lot of time to fill. In that talk, I did what I'm going to touch here soon. Uh, and that was question our most fundamental scientific beliefs and do it very precisely, because if I'm going to share one thing, the technologies are fun, but the more we understand this issue and the more we can counter arguments about um, conventional physics, the quicker we're going to adapt. It's very, very important. What gave me hope is that at the end of the lecture, the people that came up were Astonishing! I felt uh, really amazed that um, they're above me. <laughs> you know, they're just um, in in what what they'd accomplished, where they were, top level in in their fields, and they agreed. So here we're upending our most fundamental scientific beliefs, and scientists and engineers are agreeing. This is very important. I think it's, it's because it's hitting us all. We're, we're all getting downloads, and um, hitting is the wrong word. I think we're, we're, we're waking up. Um, very briefly, uh, one of the uh, projects I was working this is where I was 15 years ago. Um, I was uh, down in Florida inventing and trying to figure out 
some things. And um, what came out of it was uh, eventually this, which is the idea of combining a lot of the advanced breakthroughs that we've talked about on, in this conference. Um, uh, breakthroughs in energy, water, agriculture, um, and combining it into a simple system that can actually help a family um, adapt through whatever we're facing. Um, and uh, one of the uh, toys that uh, I was playing with back then was a, a, a design for mobility because I, I felt that we're going to become coming into times where there's going to be more nomadic um, structures, more decentralized, more nomadic. We built some prototypes, and it, it does work. We, we, we have a fairly simple model for uh, decentralized uh, support systems for homes. You can basically have a trailer that um, can take a home off-grid. And the strategy behind it is that, of course, this kind of technology relies on energy. And more precisely, the kind of energy that we're here to talk about. Now, this is the key. And, and if I'm going to convey anything here, if, if it's just this, I've, I've accomplished something. This is what we're taught. The laws of energy conservation and, and thermodynamics are most fundamental laws of which everything is built on. Our entire civilization, our technologies, our, our belief systems, our, um, our concepts of resources, this whole attitude about depletion is all based on this concept of lack. And that is the closed system. And it's this caveat to these fundamental laws. Laws, en law of energy conservation, as, as Vernon touched on yesterday, is, is our most fundamental law. All our other beliefs grow on that. And the closed system is the caveat. In a closed system, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. You can't get more out of something that you put into it. Here's the key. This is what I feel that we need to understand teach and convey. And this is crucial because I've got 100% success rate with any physicist I've talked to, and I work with a lot of them, any engineer I've talked to, I worked with a lot of engineers, 100% success rate in undermining their most fundamental beliefs in two minutes. That is what's important. It's not about what I've discovered. Look, I'm not the only one to discover this. Most of the people in this room know what, what we're talking about here. But it's about communicating it to academia so that they start to wake up. And that is absolutely crucial because for, for anybody that's been in this field, and many have been in, at this for longer than I, I mean, Jeff, my partner at Energy Bat, all his life, um, it's a huge block because we are literally outside this religion. So here's the, here's the key. The definition of a closed system is that energy density must remain constant regardless of scale. That's the definition. In other words, if you've got a gallon of gas or 100 gallons of gas, the density of that gas and the energy it can put out is the same. That's what we're taught. A big, big problem with that. It's not true. Energy density increases as size decreases. There is no such thing as a closed system. To explain this, when you look at chemical reactions and you go to nuclear reactions, you've, your scale is much, much smaller. Your energy is up by orders of magnitude. When you go from nuclear energy to matter-antimatter, energy goes through the roof, scale goes down. And here's the key point. There's no such thing as smallest. It's an infinite direction. And the only communication system we have with that dimension is in the very sciences that we're exploring. Harmonics, resonance, coherence, geometric forms, spirals, toroids. It's an infinite direction. It, it, it's impossible for our minds to 
really understand what that means. I mean, we can look out there and go, well, okay, if this ends, if this universe ends, there's something beyond it. Same in that direction. We, we live in a, in, a, in, a, in a reality of infinite. That is our reality. And that's a fascinating thing, but it's something we're not designed to handle, to understand. So when someone says you can't get more energy out than um, you put in, when someone tells you that because of the law of thermodynamics or energy conservation, what you're saying to them or what you're showing them is impossible, this is what I'm hoping we'll remember, is that the energy density example puts that to bed. Define the closed system. A closed system is impossible in this reality. It's impossible. We live in an infinite sea of energy where the smaller you go, the more energy there is. That's fact. It's huge. Now, you think of the implications of this closed system and what it's done on this planet, how it's affected even our view of nature because this resource depletion approach we've had has influenced everything, our concepts of lack, which the closed system has supported. It's, it's a really, really big deal. So these are two, two sayings I like from well-respected scientists because you've got to re, you know, quote respected scientists. There's enough energy in the space of an empty cup to boil all the oceans of the world, Richard Feynman. Huge statement, absolutely true. Talbot and Bond, every cubic centimeter of empty space contains more energy than the total energy of all the matter in the known universe. Wow. Fact. So why would you transport energy? Why would you use something called fuel? It's already wherever you are. Okay, well, here's reality. Now where do we go with this? And to grasp this, the fact that there is no smallest, the smaller you go, you, you, you find something that you think is the smallest thing in the universe. There's something called a point. Actually, the, the concept zero point, well, there's, in a way, there's not such a thing as zero, and that's not really such a thing as a point, because every point has a smaller point on it. And so really, your, your best conception is that it's nothing but holes. You know, there's, there's always something beyond where you can look. And that's just staggering for us to imagine in our little fishbowl but it's true. So, this is basically what we're dealing with right now. Nothing to see here. Hopefully now, this will help uh, as um, offering another clue, an argument, when you next talk to someone that slams you with that stuff, because many of the inventors that I work with and one of my jobs is to get as much collaboration going in this field as possible. I, I work with a lot of in, other inventors. Um, we've got to have this nailed when we go and talk to someone that wants to help. Because the next thing they're going to do is talk to someone that tells them why we're con artists. Okay, you can't get anything from nothing. Any energy from nothing? Nothing is a source of almost infinite energy potential. This is open system physics. There's no such thing as perpetual motion. That is absolutely ludicrous. Everything we've ever observed is in perpetual motion. It's called an atom and beyond. Without motion, there's no time. You can't get more energy out than you put in. And I had to throw this in because I couldn't resist in a closed mind. That's a law of the universe. <laughs> and that law was bred on this planet from the closed system. And uh, boy, it's made some doozies. Um, so, implications. Oh my goodness, we could spend a long time talking about the implications of open system physics and the fact that we have come from a closed system of limited imagination to 
open system realization that nothing is impossible. This takes you down so many rabbit holes. Most pe people in this room know this. I mean, you know, I mentioned higher consciousness and alchemy, and wow. I mean, if, if I was to look at a, a categorization of the different sciences, I might say closed system over here, open system here, and alchemy right next to it, because the link between open system physics and alchemy is profound. And the fact is there are no accidents, and consciousness is intrinsic to an open system. Deep stuff. Now I'm going to back up to closed systems, <laughs> because there are some transitions happening now. Um, and I'm only, only going to touch on vapor carburetors and, and, and HHO. Um, vapor carburetors have been around since World War II. I'm not, Jeffrey went into some history. Um, Vernon knows exactly what I'm talking about, as many, many others do. Vapor carbs have been around for a very long time. You know, the rumors of 100 mile per hour carburetors, 200 mile per hour carburetors. Um, just left a friend that's been playing them for years. They work. And it's, it's, it's pretty basic. The, uh, the um, fuel that you're using is taken down to a smaller component. Instead of uh, injecting drops, you're injecting vapor. And that vapor has a greater opportunity to get a, a full burn. And it's not very convenient for profit. Um, HHO, very, very deep subject. And I am going to touch on that a little bit because it turns out, well, one of the things I want to do is form a link between many of these technologies that are, I've uh, worked with. And it goes anywhere from uh, LENR to HHO to PAP to um, magnetic. And uh, so, try mouth. What I am going to talk about more is this. Um, Russ mentioned Elon Musk and the fact that he gave um, 120 patents away, which is commendable. He's been sort of the tip of the spear. And he sold, what, 300-odd thousand cars in one day recently? Was it? Yeah. Batteries. Um, right now, a 200 to 300 mile range electric vehicle is cute. It's not competitive with gas. However, there's a tipping point. And by the way, you know, you've got 300 mile range, you'll venture out 100 miles, and if you can't find a multi-hour charging station, you're going to go home because you don't want, you're, you're uncomfortable going further. The infrastructure doesn't exist. It's the same with a hydrogen highway. Um, but once you hit a tipping point of, say, 600 miles, 700 miles, 1,000 miles on an electric car, it has the potential to become devastatingly competitive. And that's the kind of tipping point I think many of us are hoping for. It has to happen in a way that doesn't create um, economic hardships. <laughs> now, people have different views on what those hardships are, obviously. But it is necessary. Um, so the kinds of battery technologies I'm working with uh, right now are in this realm. And uh, several in particular I'm going to discuss because we have the opportunity for closed system technologies to support open system technologies. We can actually come to the rescue of a closed system transition in various ways. And I do believe we can do this from the top down and the bottom up. And I'm not going to get into the conspiracy theories and, and other issues, uh, the technocracy. Look, we know there's some really nasty things going on behind the scenes and always have been. So, um, one of the technologies I'm working with um, is a company out in California uh, working very closely with them. We have a breakthrough that gives us a four to five times improvement in range at five to ten times lower cost. So, the energy density of the battery is four to five times higher. 
And this is just the beginning. This same battery, we've found that instead of deteriorating over a year period, it's actually doubled in capacity, which is pretty cool. And it's cheap to make. Um, I, I don't know how much I can. One of the problems of my work is that I bridge the gap between what Russ does and another approach, which is unless I sign NDAs, I don't get certain knowledge. And one of my uh, roles is to connect. And that means I'm connecting behind the scenes and I'm kept connecting out front open source. And that's it's a delicate balance, but it's something that is actually easier than uh, it may seem. So with this kind of technology, we have, and it's not the only one, we have the ability to see a real transition. Now here's a problem. Where is that energy going to be produced? A car uses about 20 times the amount of energy of a house per hour. The energy has to come from the grid. Well, now we could get into the dangers of the grid and Carrington event, sunspot activity, and devious plans about crashing it and all this stuff. The fact is, is that open system physics eventually leads to obsolescence of roads, obsolescence of grid, obsolescence, obsolescence of a lot of centralized ideas. And this kind of technology is going to put a lot of load on the grid. The other technology I'm working with is similar. Um, I could go into flow cells, that's another subject. But the bottom line is we are somewhere between um, 5 and 30 times more power dense, being conservative. And um, graphene is a subject unto itself. It is an absolutely revolutionary field that affects every field. Um, the more I've been involved in this, the more ways I see that this kind of technology can help us in this field, open system field. I'll be coming back to this because there's a side of graphene that is outside the closed box. First, let me back up. Um, here are some electric flying vehicles. And the vision was talked about a little bit yesterday, uh, Jeff and, and others. Um, one that's just emerged is the, the Ilium, has a lot of motors on it. Uh, the Ehang was just announced out of China. You've got this Flyke. There are many others. And uh, mine here, the Vision VTOL. Um, right now, using today's technology, the Ehang has about a 20 minute range. Uh, here's a video of it from the, I think it was the CES Expo. Now, I'm going to go forward on this in the interest of time, but the price point was somewhere between 200 and 300,000, and it's clearly designed for autonomous taxing of people. But with a 20 minute range, um, not much fun. Um, and this brings in the collaborative element of uh, first of all, why go into aviation? Um, first of all, I've been a pilot all my life, I've flown lots of aircraft, several hundred types, some of them really scary. Um, Fun, mostly. <laughs> um, and there's, there's, you get to the point where you have this ultimate idea of what a, a flying toy is. And um, the strategy behind this is this is designed to support energy breakthroughs. That's its purpose. But it's also designed to 
show a direction of where we can go in transportation, either with a closed system or open system. With closed system physics, this has you know, a 1,000, 2,000 mile range potential. And um, in uh, open system physics, of course, unlimited range. It's also conventional in that it's a ducted fan and we're not, um, I get into areas where I can talk and where I can't, but we're, we're playing with more advanced propulsion, obviously. Um, but in this present rendition, it's supposed to be more public than other technologies and therefore it's a ducted fan quadcopter. Now, the E-Hang had a lot of money put behind it, obviously. Um, what we've got behind this so far is that video is a $500 video. Um, there's this uh, great program online called Blender, and it's an open source um, system. So I was able to do the, uh, the uh, modeling myself, and then I, I got some other Blender enthusiasts to do the animation in the scenes. But where this differs is, of course, in range and practicality. This is a high-speed craft. It can take you anywhere. And, um, and it's also designed, actually, to go underwater in later versions. So take off out of your backyard, fly wherever you want to go, and have freedom. So the thing that differentiates this from other craft is that it is a tilt rotor. Um, and each of these rotors is autonomous um, in, in that they can operate independently, which gives you some pretty wild um, performance capabilities. Anyway, I'm going to move along from this one too. But that's the Vision VTOL. And, and um, one of the things that came out of that lecture last week is that we made a connection with some, uh, a group in um, Africa that has some of the most advanced uh, drone uh, work uh, on the planet. They're working um, to uh, thwart poachers. And um, so that uh, project has actually taken a leap forward simply because I gave a lecture. And that's the idea. We need to um, support some of the projects that will uh, get some of our technologies out. I do want to address the term free energy. I love the term free energy because it's very specific. The energy is free. It's, we're not talking about free equipment. You didn't say free equipment. And I've got many colleagues that say, oh, I don't want to say free energy. You know what? Jedi. It's free. That's the basis of an abundant-based economy. That's powerful. The energy is free. How you tap it, get smart. Find the cheapest way. Uh, also, the idea of using energy as a currency, purely a transition move. If it's, a, it's eventually free, currency can only be a transition move. But it does maybe have its place, although after seeing the technocracy thing, that really scares me. Um, I'm really not going to get into the history, but I have really studied it. Uh, it goes back a long way, and there are absolute heroes with some of the names on that list. And that's just a small percentage. Jeff covered some of the, the guys like Newman and uh, uh, people like Russell, Keeley, Schauberger, Tesla especially. These are sort of the big four to me. Uh, that's where my education started. This is a free energy system. This is an open system energy system. And no, I'm not going to talk about wind and solar much. But the source of energy comes from the sun. It's not in the panel. <laughs> you stick that in a closet, it does nothing. That's an open system technology. Not the most practical, <laughs> but it's doing the job right now in our current paradigm. Uh, wind. Now, I <laughs> two, two years ago, I came up with an example, and Jeff uh, talked about it briefly. Um, because I come out of an aviation background in aerodynamics, I know the subject somewhat. And the way conventional wind turbines 
um, are made to me is, is ludicrous. And so I came up with a design that um, has actually led somewhere. It, it, one aerodynamicist came up with 122 times more efficient, and uh, another one has done a, a, a physicist has studied it, and, and um, we'll get into that in a little bit. But essentially, um, wind turbines can use drag. And what I mean by drag is that ridge is drag. It's an obstacle. The wind has to go through around it. And the wind was forced to go around something with no penalty. It just got in the way. So what I've done is incorporate that into the design itself. See that big disc right there? Notice that that's pointed into the wind. So the wind is coming this way. What I'm doing is creating an obstacle, forcing the air to accelerate before I use it. And when it reaches its maximum point of leverage and velocity, and the velocity goes up radically, um, uh, the, um, the force goes up radically with velocity. So um, by pointing all the, the uh, blades into the wind at the, the maximum point of leverage, you make use of all the air going through that uh, area rather than just a very small amount like that. Anybody looking at that uh, three-blade system realizes that most of that air does absolutely nothing as it blasts, blasts on through there. Only the tips do the work. Now let's go through this further here. All right. Um, I'm not going to talk about any of the stuff we got at Energy Bat. It's a lot of different systems and, and uh, an incredible resource. Uh, but this is one of the, the ways that Jeff and I met, because we were both working with a similar technology. Uh, he calls it the CQ. I call it peripheral jet. But it is actually the same kind of technology as that wind turbine. And so what I'm hoping to do here is show a tie between these systems where um, there's a, some fundamental principles occurring throughout. Um, one of the combinations with that turbine is this, the Lord's Pump. This is Al Throckmorton. And he basically took a ram pump idea, which uses water as a piston, and drives that with hydrogen, oxygen mix. And that's purely separated from water with a high efficiency um, water cracker. The higher efficiency, the better. And this is not about electrolysis, separation of water. This is about more intelligent ways. And Vernon can talk about that um, more also, because water is a very useful substance as an amplifier, not a fuel. Very important distinction between those two. Um, open system physics understands that any substance, any matter, is a potential amplifier. It's not something that gets thrown away afterwards because it was converted into something unusable or destructive, and that's what fuel is. A completely different concept. So the idea was to have the pump drive the turbine if the turbine wasn't uh, over unity enough by itself. Um, that's how that link was made. So we've gone in, in parallel development on both those projects. And it's, um, it works quite well. Uh, this is one I dem uh, talked about uh, two years ago because it, it's the most rudimentary and simple example of going from that same amplification of force with the wind turbine to um, creating an impact and disassociating molecules into atoms. In this case, you're basically slamming a droplet of water into a, into a wall, and the resultant toroid expansion wave basically separates inertially the hydrogen and oxygen and creates very low pressure, very high static regions, which then ignite that same pulse. Uh, to put that simply, you make a bunch of steam with a diesel fuel injector. <laughs> um, 
it's still under development, and uh, Richard is, uh, I believe, moving to India. This is something I invented uh, 10, 12 years ago before I really knew a lot of this other stuff, probably a download. I came across Tesla's uh, valvular conduit, which is a, a one-way fluidic diode, and I developed uh, this <coughs> variation on it. Uh, Al Throckmorton <coughs> excuse me, is uh, moving forward with this uh, also. Uh, Russ Grease made uh, some 3D printed parts, and it, it works very well. Um, the idea is that you can actually create a detonation uh, inside this device, and it goes back to some very interesting notes of Tesla from many, many years ago, which have since disappeared over, uh, off the net, which he claimed that if you applied heat to his conduit and he had water flowing through it, at some point, after it reached, reached a resonant pulse, you could remove the Benson burner which would make it a very, very simple device. So we're hoping to have more results on that soon. I want to show a movie of this. Now we're going to get into cavitation a little bit further. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I would encourage uh, seeing Maury King's lecture of uh, BEM 2013. Great uh, lecture on cavitation and uh, how it overlaps HHO. Um, Peter Grano uh, and Neil Grano uh, did some early work with uh, cavitation pulses, and this overlaps the um, amplification approach of things like the um, the wind turbine peripheral jet, and now takes us into implosion physics and LENR and um, releases of um, much more powerful energy at a, a small scale. And you can find a phenomenal example right here in nature called the pistol shrimp. Um, looks like it froze anyway. Um, now going further into this, uh, um, Leclerc gave a very good lecture um, uh, two years ago at BEM, and this is where we have to be careful because they, they actually did get a dose of gamma in their research. But this is Nanospire and uh, excellent work. And, and one of the approaches they've taken is to release a lot of their information onto the net for their own protection. Um, but they're, they're still, like many of us, in need of funding. But this, of course, uses the same kind of effect uh, to release um, energy from the very small and amplify it. Um, in this case, you're getting alchemic effects because um, I'm not going to go into the because. That would be too long. We've got to move on. But it, it's a fascinating subject and explains a lot about LENR. And I, I consider them to be one of the top uh, in, in that field. Uh, it also breaches into an area which, un unfortunately, I can't talk about. But if, if you want to find out more, um, depending on who you are, uh, we can go into some of the other stuff that we're doing that, unfortunately, I can't uh, speak about here. But it really is exciting stuff. And it explains so much that I've been in search of for so many years. And believe me, open system is the energy technologies. There are very, very simple ways of achieving this. We now know this. Um, here are some of the other people that have worked with it. Obviously, Russ said uh, that he's uh, working with it. Um, Joe sells a fascinating device. Vernon's got a lot of uh, um, experience with that. And we've obviously seen some alchemic reactions. I'm working with and friends with, honored to know, uh, over eight alchemists that all have a different perspective on that field. It's fascinating stuff, everything from remediation of, of uh, nuclear uh, waste to profound effects on consciousness and the history. I want to talk about Brown's gas because here's another thing that's right in front of our nose. Brown's gas temperature of that flame, 260 degrees Fahrenheit, compared to acetylene, the sun. Now look at this, tungsten melts at 6,200 degrees, vaporizes at over 10,000 degrees. Yet that flame will take tungsten to those temperatures almost instantly. 
There's a video about that. Um, I'll be very quick. But this is uh, Denny Klein, I think. He came up, uh, put his own name on it. I think he, he was the one that called it HHO. Yeah. We don't have sound on it, but that's OK. But here he is uh, ripping through various materials with a 260 degree flame, which won't boil water, by the way. So very interesting. It, it leads you down some very interesting conclusions. I'll leave it at that. But it shows that when you jump from 260 degrees to 10,000 degrees almost instantly, where's that energy coming from? Very important question. Um, I'll move quickly through some of these technologies. Just so This is going to be available on the internet, so you'll be able to go back and, and spend more time on each one of these. But induction heating is a fascinating area. And believe it or not, has much in common with what I just showed you. There's similar principles throughout all of this. Uh, Norden, uh, Jane Norden, um, uh, did some work on the Jijin. And I should have put his credits up there. I'm sorry. Um, but um, uh, also, Infinity Sav has a unit um, that um, seems to be working. This is where you're using induction, which is commonly used, to actually go beyond 100% efficiency levels. And we have uh, technologies that we could call it COP or whatever you want, but essentially uh, uh, are getting four to 10 times amplification of input. Um, this is Phoenix Energy NV. I visited them, really great guys. Uh, they come out of the nuclear and conventional industries. And um, they have about 10 times amplification. And uh, this can make for a very simple uh, um, centralized system. So for conversion of existing uh, nuclear plants, for instance. Um, I have other technology examples that I would use for, say, coal plant conversion. But essentially, the main power plants are steam engines. Um, and this kind of technology has a role to play in decentralizing those centralized structures, or at least converting them to fuelless power sources. Um, at the same time, making sure that um, we have ways to build the same devices as individuals. Brilliant Light Power, formerly Black Light Power, they've been around for a long time. Um, they've been well funded. Um, and the thing I find fascinating about this is because the um, research and the theories that Randall Mills has about collapsed state atoms matches precisely some of the other work I've been involved with. Um, I won't go into PAP or uh, that in detail, but interesting work. and. He claims he has a viable um, technology now. Cash is quite an enigma. I'm not going to go uh, deep there, just like Vernon wasn't. But um, I think some people have been very frustrated. Others have dove in with both feet. And I know one group in Peru has actually uh, got confirmation of his technologies working for power generation. I believe that there's a very, very strong link between what he calls GANs uh, and plasmatic uh, to ORMI state materials or monatomic elements, the, the alchemy. Um, I, 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 I'm almost certain of that. Um, there's a lot of electromagnetic uh, systems. Tawari in, in India, I mentioned, because it's fairly complicated. There are simpler systems, but this is uh, this is, a, this is a great development. Uh, EBM, they've been around for a long time. And uh, all indication is that their, their systems work, also electromagnetic. Infinity Sav, um, they have a lot of different experiments they've done and some compelling videos. I'm hoping to get over to see them soon. Um, Platinum Invest has been around for a, a couple of years. Um, they obviously have funding, and it's hard to, to tell where they are in terms of what they're commercializing. I want to come back to graphene because this is, this is a big deal, because it, it, it is something that can affect us at a grassroots. Um, and boy, I, could, I wish I could remember his name. There's a, um, a researcher in England, I had it in my notes, um, that's done a lot of work to open source how to make your own graphene. Why is this important? Because in the last year, I've 
come across four different uh, research projects where we now know graphene is able to produce energy. This is really cool. Um, it's specific ways, I can't go into some of those unfortunately, but there are more than one. And the potential for power density is every bit as high as the power density of graphene batteries. So we're talking about the ultimate solid state CP module. <laughs> um, and I think uh, we'd be well served to pay a lot of attention to this. Um, so how does this all over uh, uh, interact? Um, and again, I put NDA up there because unfortunately, uh, if you want to know more about uh, some of these things, and obviously we can't cover too much in an hour, um, you know, I, I, I can talk to people privately. And my primary function is, is to connect people as much as possible, uh, both in the open and a as their privacy demands. And I've had the privilege to become involved in a lot of projects that I wouldn't uh, otherwise have been able to do. Um, for me, it's given me kind of an eagle eye view on the field. Um, I, I'm just that type. I need to see all these different perspectives. Um, but it's given me, I think, some understanding of what's going on at the most basic level. And from that perspective, I, I seem to be able to help various projects uh, by um, contributing ideas and, and hopefully getting as much collaboration going as possible. Um, collaboration is everything. Each one of us, I run into so many inventors unfortunately because this system we've created uh, cultivates huge egos and in, in the inventor realm that ego manifests itself often in this idea that I'm the only one that's discovered this. I've got a, a solution that will solve all the world's problems, and I'm the one. <laughs> and you just want to say, oh, you poor. <laughs> you know, um, I'll do what I can to convince you now. The chances are that it's going to be later on um, after some pain. <laughs> but. Um, <clears throat> It is very, very important for us to overcome that fear and that, especially of the predation of um, um, investment. I found that 95% of the investment opportunities out there have been predatory, highly predatory. Uh, on the other hand, because of the fear-based paradigm that many of the inventors are in, um, it can create similar problems. And we've got to overcome that ego. We have got to. None of us are more important than anybody else. And, and the sooner we realize we're one, not many separate, isolated, I'm better than yous, we'll move forward much quicker. Um, all right, well. This is what we really are facing. If we can just um, become strong enough as a group to overcome the obstacles we're facing, I believe that we've got an amazing future if we hold on to that. Be Jedi's, like Susan said. And reality is an open system. No ifs, ands, or buts. And use that argument if you don't have a better one yourself. And if you do, please come see me so I can use it. All right, thanks. And Thank you very much, Mike Waters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Listening to that presentation, it was astounding. And I think that if even just one or two of those technologies that, we just, uh, that you just showed and that aren't even theory, that are working models, if one or two of those technologies were implemented, the world would change. So thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>